Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our conversation around institutionalizing um, public interest technology. My name is, uh, I'll be moderating the session. My name is Hazem Mahmoud. I'm the director of uh, data solutions at the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, um, where I lead a team of um, data scientists, engineers, product managers uh, to build and deploy data and AI products for the social good sector. So in many ways, it's very similar to the work, the great work that many of you are doing uh, within PIT. So as we think about um, public interest technology and, and a lot of the conversations we've had over the last day, it feels like it's been a few days, um, but over the last 24 hours, um, we wanna think about the next natural question really comes to me at least, and I'm sure for many of you, is how do we ensure sustainability of this, right? How do we institutionalize this to make sure that the long-term um, institutional support will continue to provide the impact um, that this brings to our communities and the collaborative outcomes um, that it brings as well, specifically to marginalized and minority communities. And so we have here uh, you know, a group uh, of incredible leaders um, that will walk us how they've, through how they've developed institutional support within um, you know, their organizations, uh, some of the challenges they've had to navigate, um, as well as how they built relationships and activated resources on campuses or within their organizations. So to start us off, maybe um, Azar, maybe you can start us off with just, uh, I mean, each of you, if you could give a little introduction, um, but also just a glimpse or some of the highlights of how you've institutionalized uh, public interest technology in your campuses or on your organiza organization. So, sure. Let's go to see. Um, thank you. Um, it's great to be uh, here and it's great to share um, at least the narrative, the story at BU. Um, so I was lucky because the way PIT was created is um, came organically because of the university thinking about its strategic plan, 2030. It's called BU 2030. Um, so there was a realization that computing and data sciences um, are permeating every field and transforming, if not already transformed, these fields, as well as professions. So if we want to make impact on society, um, that we can think of computing and data sciences as a catalyst for that impact. Um, and the question was, what is the best way to have a catalyst for, for, for impact um, based on computing and data sciences? Um, university put together a task force. The task force came back and says, here is what you should do. You should not... Um, you should not assign this to any existing unit because it has to be university-wide. So you should create an academic unit unlike any other that cross-cuts all the others. And here's the other piece they said. And it has to have a different culture because it has to be interdisciplinary, it has to be focused on impact. So it's very important to give it autonomy, which means give it faculty lines, allow it to develop its own programs, and most importantly, be free from the straight jackets of the disciplines from, when it, from which it comes. That's how CDS was created. Um, now, I mentioned the strategic plan. The strategic plan had, for BU had a number of pillars. One of them is research that matters. It's interesting, right? So what is the priority? Research that matters. That matters for who? For society. That's PIT, if you think about it but delivered through multiple disciplines. Now, with an investment like what BU has done, you are sitting in the result of that in, uh, investment, this big building and all the faculty and all that, um, it was important to support the other pillars of the strategic plan, uh, plan, which were what? Vibrant academic experiences, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and community. So if you just think about these words, that is public interest technology. So this is how it, it happened at BU. I was very lucky that it came organically. Um, uh, and uh, you know, maybe I'll stop here. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, Mina? That is an amazing story. Uh, and I wish I could say that we had a task force that, that put this together. So my name is Mina Sheng. 
Um, I lead the United States Digital Service, which is a team right now of about 200 public interest technologists attached to the White House. Um, and we deploy in small interdisciplinary teams, including product managers, designers, engineers, data scientists, procurement experts, and folks who are experts in government implementation. And we deploy across the federal government to help agencies and occasionally states um, build and deploy technology in thoughtful, reasonable, user-centered, equitable, um, and modern ways. So really helping agencies and helping up-level technology implementation across the federal government, but through actual implementation programs. Um, we are just had our ninth birthday, so building institutional support has been an exercise of practice um, and actual work every single year, working with agencies, delivering results, and having agencies continue to see what their peers are accomplishing and realize that they, in fact, want to be able to accomplish that as well. Um, you know, unlike a, a tidy task force that, that put forth such amazing recommendations, uh, the impetus for creating this entity um, came out of a crisis. So one thing we often say in government is never waste a crisis. Um, crises are a real impetus for action. And the crisis that sort of helped catalyze the creation of the US Digital Service was the failure of healthcare.gov and the recognition that one, like healthcare.gov had built into um, a policy objective, a technology platform. As you all know, and as um, we've just discussed, technology underpins everything we do today. All of implementation, all of the work um, that companies, organizations do, anything that requires thinking or in transacting with people, technology underlies that. And so healthcare, the Affordable Care Act recognized that, built it in, but then the failure of implementation and technology really ran the risk of scuttling a huge policy objective. And so starting to recognize that you need to have not only expertise in writing and deploying policy, which is words on a page, but also in writing and deploying everything that enables that as an integrated part of the program um, was sort of the genesis of the creation of USCS. Um, at the time, we were a very small, kind of a startup, and over the last nine years, uh, through performance, through building relationships, um, we have grown, as you see, um, and you know some of that is Congress funding, but we continue every single week to have more demand for the work that we do um, than there is capacity for uh, across our team. So uh, you'll hear me say it later, but we are always hiring. One of the other things that we have taken on, though, um, in recent times to talk about institutionalization is we are working with a number of agencies that have begun the journey, worked with us, to say, you should build into your budget and your personnel planning. How are you going to take on this work and carry it forward over the next decades? And so we're working with them on how to do um, both subject matter expert and equitable hiring practices, um, working with them to understand what flexibility there is in the hiring and, and where to go looking for um, experts in public interest technology and technologists who fit the bill. Um, so we are expanding not only our organization, but working with a wide array of agencies across the federal government to expand their capabilities in these regards as well. So wonderful to be here. Very excited for the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Dave Gustin, and I'm at Arizona State University, and I have two parts of my title that I will use to describe some of the institutionalization of KIT uh, at ASU. Uh, part of my title is uh, Founding Director Emeritus, because I'm no longer the director, of ASU School for the Future of Innovation Society. And this is a school that was created in 2015, uh, a little bit before the conversations around public interest technology began, um, but is part of a set of academic conversations around uh, the governance of emerging technologies, around responsible innovation, around science, technology, and society, or science and technology studies that have been part of the academy for several decades. And the school at ASU emerged from a <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from mostly a set of research activities that had gone on initially 
uh, sponsored at Columbia University, where ASU's President Michael Crow had previously been around a research center that he had created called the Center for Science Policy and Outcomes, whose motto then as now is rethinking the role of science in society. That center, <coughs> excuse me, that center um, ended up at ASU when President Crow, uh, when Michael Crow ended up at ASU, and at that time, in his inaugural address at ASU, set out a vision for a new American university that was very much after the vision of the uh, land-grant universities that were set up in the Morrill Act that we heard a bit about uh, yesterday. ASU is not the land-grant institution in the state of Arizona, alas, our neighbors down uh, the 10 in Tucson are, um, but uh, Crow in his uh, scholarship as a science policy scholar recognized the virtue of that kind of model and began ways of institutionalizing that at ASU, including articulating a set of design aspirations for a new American university that had use-inspired research, intellectual fusion, um, global engagement, and so on at their heart. Um, that milieu allowed us to compete successfully for a large award from the National Science Foundation to look at the governance of emerging nanotechnologies in particular under the National Nanotechnology Initiative. When that uh, initiative um, wound down, when that research center that I directed wound down, uh, my colleagues and I went to Mike and said, well, um, can you keep our cost share going for a little bit more? And that's one of the major lessons of institutionalization cost share from the center, because um, so we can figure out what uh, what we do next. Uh, Mike said, oh, I know what you're going to do next. You're going to create this school. Uh, so yes, Mike, yes, Mike, we created a school for the future of innovation in society. And we have collected now uh, something just short of 55 faculty members. That's not all FTEs, but 55 faculty members in a tenure granting school uh, at the university that represent more than 40 disciplines and six non-PhD preparations. And we are sort of the beating heart of interdisciplinarity at ASU. Second, so we have that opportunity to uh, work in this interdisciplinary pit space around this intellectual tradition that has gone on for decades. Uh, the second part of my title is as Associate Vice Provost for Discovery, Engagement, and Outcomes at our Julian Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. And the Global Futures Laboratory is now a university-wide structure uh, the word, where the word laboratory is meant to describe a scale of operation that aspires to national laboratory size. Think Sandia, think uh, Los Alamos, and so on. We have 700 affiliated faculty across uh, the university in the Global Futures Laboratory. Uh, and the mission of the Global Futures Lab meshes up with what we've heard about uh, human thriving is basically about allowing humans to thrive on a changing planet. And so we now have a university-wide apparatus to think about these issues. Um, and in the role that I have as Associate Vice Provost, um, it's basically my and my staff's uh, chore to begin to make this university within a university function uh, along those aspirations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Irwin, can you uh, share a little bit uh, from your end? Thank you for joining us virtually as well. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Just to yes, we can. We're good. Excellent. So uh, thanks very much for having me and thanks for allowing me to participate virtually this morning. I really appreciate that. Um, just could not get out of DC uh, yesterday or today, believe it or not. Um, so uh, my name is Irwin Chen and I have the pleasure and the honor of leading uh, a relatively new organization rooted within the National Science Foundation, the Director for Technology and Emergency Partnerships, or TFE, TIP for short. Um, and, you know, I think that when I think about TIP, uh, as some of you uh, who I know are in the room and who have had some conversation over the last year or two uh, will, will know, uh, I think about a lot of what we're trying to do is very much aligned with uh, PIT is very much aligned with sort of trying to figure out how we can institutionalize that both here at NSF, but then also more generally at the myriad organizations, universities, community colleges, technical schools, um, as well as industry and others whom we support and whom we touch all across the country too. Um, so from, from our perspective, you know, this is a story that's a little bit both bottom up and top down as well. 
uh, bottom up in the sense that even prior to the establishment of this new directive uh, about a year and a half ago, one of the first things that we, uh, one of the things that we did actually led by a different director that I worked in at the time, the Computer Information Science and Engineering Director, uh, was to really try to be responsive to what we were seeing in the community, uh, the research community, as well as the intersection between the research community and the general public uh, around some of the challenges that cities and communities all across this country are facing. Um, that you know, we, we, we heard from the community broadly, uh, we ran workshops, we ran engagements, uh, and that led us to a realization that there was an opportunity for us to really invest in what we called at the time smart and connected communities or later the civic innovation challenge, but invest in activities that allow us to be able to really bring researchers together with practitioners, together with residents in cities and communities to really better understand the challenges that they face on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be in terms of water, in terms of transportation, in terms of healthcare, and so forth. Uh, and based off of those challenges, really take an approach that allows us to, through socio-technical uh, pursuits, not just technology, but really bringing technology together with society and a better understanding of behavioral science and, and so forth, and other kinds of drivers, to really develop new approaches that address those challenges, but in a way that 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 does so with sort of the responsible attributes designed in from the start. Uh, so that's an investment that uh, through that bottom up power of the community really speaking broadly, uh, computer scientists, social scientists, systems engineers, and others really speaking broadly about the opportunity space that we saw a gap in we were able to create these investments and over time we've sustained those investments um, and i think the, the proof has been in the pudding in terms of the projects that we have funded and how they have had transformative impact in communities across the country uh, so that's sort of the bottom up uh, perhaps perspective um, and then the flip side is sort of top down uh, and that's where i think the tip director um, really comes into play uh, so about three, four years ago, as some of you know, um, there were senators in Congress who uh, felt very strongly about some of the competitiveness challenges, uh, technology competitiveness challenges in particular, that we faced and we continue to face today vis-a-vis uh, -vis other nations and uh, you know, other, other countries around the world. Um, that the level of investment that we were seeing in AI, in quantum, in biotechnology, uh, in a uh, variety of different technology areas. Um, you know, were we keeping pace with the levels of investments that we were seeing other nations uh, pour into these areas as well? Um, and so they, they drafted legislation that initially called for a whole new agency in the federal government. It took several, several um, efforts and conversations and, and fits and starts, I would say, as some of you know. Um, but ultimately, a couple of years later, um, that legislation and some of that was primed not just by technology competitiveness in those areas, but also the semiconductor and supply chain issues that we were facing, really primed to um, uh, say, okay, we're going to pass legislation, the Chips and Science Act, and among other things, it's going to authorize a new director at NSF that really takes on this mantle of address, helping to address, helping to sort of accelerate addressing some of our technology competition issues. Um, but it went further than that as well. If you read the legislation, if you read the statute around the TIP directory, it's not just about technology for technology's sake, but it also acknowledges the many societal and economic challenges that we face from climate to clean energy to critical infrastructure and so forth. And it also further acknowledges to a large degree the fact that to be able to do all of this work, to be able to do this acceleration, we need to do a much better job of engaging the full and diverse population that exists all across the country. Um, you know, a lot of our investments have tended to concentrate on the coasts, uh, in big cities and big R1 institutions, um, but there is uh, talent everywhere. And as, as my boss, who used to be at ASU, um, has said multiple times in the past, uh, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to create opportunity everywhere and to really seize upon the innovation potential that exists anywhere in this country. Um, and so I think that those factors from a top-down perspective, together with our own thinking, uh, the director's thinking, uh, the team's thinking here, perhaps also with 
conversations that we had with the community. I think all of that really led to sort of a vision for the TIP directorate, which is one where, you know, we want to foster regional innovation, particularly in parts of the country that um, could benefit from additional investment. Uh, there's, there's talent there, there's opportunity space there, there's sort of an expertise set, um, but there's been uh, historically less investment or underinvestment that that, that uh, uh, investment by NSF could allow for that to really be turbocharged. Um, but also at the same time, doing it in a way that ensures that the technology that we're enabling is, is, is um, sort of baked into the design from the start, uh, the guardrails, the, the, the safety, the security, the, the, the responsibility attributes more generally into those technologies. In fact, as part of the statute, one of the things that uh, Congress uh, required us to think about is um, what are the um, sort of how do we think about these technologies in the public interest broadly? It's, it's essentially codified without using those terms, maybe codified in the statute for us. And so when we think about the programs, when we think about the investments, when we think about how do we institutionalize this, we think about it from the very start of conceptualizing an investment that we might want to pursue, a program or activity that we might want to pursue. How do we bring the right sets of stakeholders to the table to have that dialogue about how this investment is going to ultimately be in the public interest? Could be for a particular region, but it could be at scale as well beyond that too. And maybe I'll stop there. I'm sure that there will be more conversation as we go forward. Yeah, no, thank you, Erwin, for that. Um, and building on what you said about bringing stakeholders to the table, um, and maybe David, you could kick us off with this one. Um, what are some of the incentives that institutional leaders um, um, commit, like why would they want to commit significant resources to PIT? And what are those incentives that you found were successful in your situation? Yeah, so at ASU, which is a very large public institution that is committed to student access and student success, um, students are front and center in that conversation about the, the value of PIT. And the School for the Future of Innovation Society um, taking advantage of the beginning of uh, PUN and taking advantage of those opportunities that I uh, described in my opening remarks, created a um, online Master of Science degree in public interest technology that was uh, sort of the first to market uh, PIT degree. And one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that in this giant public institution, um, PIT is still trying to find its way as a field and as a connection for students to recognize that there is um, you know, something at the end, the career trajectory, the career path, and so on. And so, for example, the, the work that uh, the network has begun to do around career uh, fairs and things like that is crucially important work. A second uh, element that allows us to, to connect and, and create incentives for folks are the large, beginning to be larger scale opportunities that uh, the Technology Innovation Partnerships uh, Directorate at NSF and other provisions, say, in the Chips and Science Act that were alluded to that the National Science Foundation has to um, address the ethical and societal considerations of all the work that it funds um, and put together a plan by, say, 10 months from now, I think is what the legislation said, which really says that not just that uh, PIs have to change, but that universities have to change. And so in response to that mandate that comes out of the Chips and Science Act, um, we are now you know, sort of authorized to operate at a university-wide level to think about adding intellectual capacity that reflects this interdisciplinary pit, that reflects the synthesis of values in science and technology in order to secure our future opportunities with 10 to 15% of our entire research portfolio. And that's crucially important. Similar to that, the uh, Justice 40 initiatives that we've also seen in the Biden administration uh, playing out through uh, R&D programs in the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Agency and elsewhere creates the opportunity, the incentive, the necessity for universities to respond in ways that think about engaging with publics in deep ways to deliver those results. So those are, I think, the two most important aspects. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And Mina, I mean, as far as the USDS is concerned, 
not obviously academic, but I mean, what, what are those incentives that you look for? The, the framing of the question is really interesting, so I'm gonna say mm -hmm. how it has played out and also to tee up some re research questions, I think, for all the institutions here. Um, the incentives are different for all of the different parties at play. So I will say for technologists who are interested in public interest, and many of the folks who come to work for us got their start in technology 10 to 15 years ago when we didn't use those terms, but it, you know, it's folks who have a background in technology and are excited about it. They already feel like this is an incredible, incredibly meaningful way to contribute. So for example, we're on track to get 8,000 applications this year. We will hire about 3% of those. So there's a ton of appetite to come and do meaningful work and to use their technology skills in that way um, in a place where they're highly leveraged. So there's that appeal. In terms of like impacts to end users and the people on the front lines who are um, touching end users, there's also just a tremendous amount of support. Um, you know, we've done work over the last decade to help improve access to services for veterans. Um, trust ratings at the VA are now 20% higher than they were nine years ago. And it is not completely due to technology, but you know, we have completely revamped the way that um, their front door and their website works, how veterans are able to navigate services and access information about where their claims are. Um, the team there launched, built a large public interest technology team inside the VA. They launched a mobile app last year that has almost five stars and over 80,000 uh, reviews. So it's an, over a million users. So it's an incredibly like appealing user experience for end users. And the people who are servicing those end users on the front lines experience that every single day, right? People are less frustrated, they have a better job. Um, similarly, you know, we're working with the Social Security Administration, we help them relaunch their front door and are helping rebuild their call center. Um, we're working with refugees, we're working, uh, you know, we, we get to jump in on crises like when there was an infant formula crisis. In all of these scenarios, everyone on the front lines sees and understands the impact viscerally and in their everyday interactions. And we all know that all of these demographics are used to having terrible interactions with government based on a lot of paper forms, right? So you can see the delta and there's a lot of, it's, it's appealing and it builds trust and it builds, and it starts to change expectations about what we can and should expect from our federal and from our government services at every level. Um, so I think those incentives, you know, actually changing outcomes and lives. One of the interesting questions is like, at that higher level strategic and budgeting layer, the incentives, um, I think you all study this more than me, and, I, and I, I'm excited to be here. Everyone else in my family is a professor, and I am not, so this is a true honor uh, and, and an aspiration for me. Um, but the, the model of accountability and oversight in government is not about achieving specific outcomes and being held accountable to outcomes, but it is very much an oversight model, right? There are um, IGs, there is congressional oversight, the way that we try and hold um, services accountable is not the same way that incentives are set up um, in the context of like an organization that receives its funding based on how well it serves user needs. And so I think there's some really interesting user, there's some really interesting research topics in that. And I would deep, like I get inbound all the time on what should we, offer as technical assistance to the Hill? What should we say about how do we drive forward on customer experience legislation? Or how do we set up the incentives differently? It would be incredibly helpful to have more insight and more research in that area and what, um, how the structure of sort of oversight and accountability as it's set up across different levels and different places in government, um, how that really affects the way. Because it's, it, right now there are not the incentives at the budgeting and the management layers to say, okay, we need to invest in this because it will achieve the outcomes that we all seek in terms of engaging with the public. Instead, the incentives are, how do I make sure that um, I don't end up testifying or with an IG report that says I tried to offer a service and it was not 1,000% compliant with these 47 different requirements. So. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that, Mina. Um, Azar, I'm curious, you touched a little bit in the introduction about you know, how you've been working on institutionalizing PIT what are those key levers or mechanisms by which you did that um, here at VU? Um, 
Yeah, so I, maybe I, sh I should go back a little bit to say that we had all the ingredients for what we wanted to do, and that helps. So let me give you some examples. Um, you all heard about Bio Spark last yesterday and the students and all that. Well, Bio Spark was created before the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences was done, actually well before, two or three years before. Well, it was created for a gift to give students experiential learning opportunities, internships and all that. You do this by having the students work on real projects that are sourced from, let's say, the city of Boston or nonprofits. So that piece was there. What else? We had amazing collaboration between very distant fields. Uh, computer science and law. We have scholars in both. And they're our top scholars. They're the name professors who are, do, who are doing it. So they're already doing this. They're already collaborating on things to do with regulatory questions, legal questions of new technology across the board. What else? Every department is already starting to think about, well, how do I deal with computation and data? How do I teach my students that? So I have to start with this, because when you make an investment as big as what BU has made in computing and data sciences, you really have to think about the entire university. You cannot just do that for one department. And if you think about it, every department benefits from this. So here is another level that everyone is, will stand to gain from this investment. And that's very important. And let's talk about the administrative side. So, so from, from the perspective of, of the Board of Trustees or the President, why is this important? Well, actually, this is a great story for BU, if you think about it, um, for fundraising, for signaling to the world that this is how BU is betting on the future, right? So, so these are the levers that really um, help CDS be what it is today. Um, well, thank you for that, Azar. Um, Erwin, a question for you in regards to when we think about like what is at stake here if we don't take steps towards institutionalizing public interest technology, uh, whether from your perspective within the NSF or, or more broadly in the industry? So, so I mean, I think that to a large extent, uh, what's at stake is, is the continued separation between the technology that we're developing and that we are enabling and the society that needs and uses that technology, right? And I think that um, it, it essentially creates a mismatch uh, and it also perpetuates some of, the, some of the challenges that we have seen laid bare over the course of the last several years with some of these emerging technologies as well. You think about AI, you think about the pain points that we've seen, you know, um, so there are lots of positives associated with generative AI. There are lots of benefits associated with GANs and so forth. But then there are also many pain points that we have observed, whether it be deep fakes, whether it be misinformation, disinformation, and so forth. Um, and so I think that by not really engendering, and, and AI is one example, right? You can imagine similar challenges and pain points and worries in the biotechnology space too. Uh, you know, I don't want to just focus on my computer science colleagues too, too much. So I think that, uh, you know, across the spectrum, you see that and you see sort of this, this uh, growing divide between why we are pursuing these technologies and, and, and how they can be helpful to society um, if you don't really take that into a start. Now, I think I'll say a couple of things that sort of, if I can, that sort of get to some of the other questions that you posed to the other panelists this morning already. Um, you know, when we conceptualized the TIP director, one of the things that we said at the outset was, um, you know, NSF for a long has done a lot of a lot of good by virtue of the investments that we make uh, to faculty at universities, um, great ideas, great um, uh, thought leaders, great students. Um, and, and we've then pushed some of those um, uh, new capabilities, new discoveries, new technologies out into the market. 
Um, but what we are trying to stand for at TIP is really bringing the users, the consumers, the beneficiaries of that research to the table to help shape and motivate that research from the start. Um, and I think that that glue of co-design and co-creation, where you have folks rolling up their sleeves and working together, is what really ultimately enables that symbiosis between these technologies and what were the original societal needs and use cases that motivated and engendered the pursuit of those technologies. And so I think that's really what's at the core of this in my mind. Um, and then I, I will also say, you, know, you, you, you talked a little bit about incentives. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you three incentives, if I can, just real quick, um, that you think are consistent with what you've heard and maybe build on what you've heard a little bit as well. Um, one is talent. You know, one of the things that I, I hear from faculty uh, like Azar and others, um, you know, post-pandemic, a lot of our early career talent that's going into classrooms, that's going into science and technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM fields, they're going into those fields because they saw what STEM could do during the course of the pandemic to mitigate uh, some of the worst pain points of that, of that uh, pandemic. Um, and they feel that there's an opportunity for them to now be able to engage and pursue technologies on their own to help address some of these societal challenges that we face today. Uh, and economic challenges too, right? And helping find ways to be able to allow folks to move up the economic ladder in different parts of our country and all around the world for that matter. Um, and so I think that, you know, one of the incentives has to be the people who are coming into the STEM enterprise, the research and innovation enterprise, the technology development enterprise. I think those folks are craving for um, more efforts along these lines. Um, the other is, you know, let's go back to first principles about what we've always strived for the innovation ecosystem in our nation. Uh, you know, th there was a time, I think, when universities were seen as the um, uh, uh, beacon on the hill. They were seen as the, as the, sorry about that, they were seen as the, as the, um, as the, as the resource for their community, for their region, to be able to tackle some of the challenges in the community, the community and region in which they are located and in which they effectively serve. Um, I think that's still true. I don't want to paint a broad brush stroke and suggest that we've, we've moved completely away from that, but I think there needs to be sort of a resurgence of that to some extent. Um, and then finally, the third one is obviously, um, you know, there's, there's always funding in it. I'm at a funding agency, so I can't not mention funding, but you know, being able to put dollars to efforts such as this, I think that's critical if we want to think about what are the incentives that motivate leaders to be able to um, uh, really institutionalize this more broadly. Thank you so much, everyone, for that. Um, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, thank you to all the panelists, but we did want to open it up for any questions from the audience. I'm not sure if there's... Yes, we have a question. Uh, thank you very much. I'm an academic, and my incentive is to publish. Where do I publish pit research? A um, couple of excellent places, two of which have their editorial homes at Arizona State University, if I might. Um, the Journal of Responsible Innovation, uh, which is um, which of which I was the founding editor in chief. Uh, my colleague Eric Fisher is now the editor in chief, and it's uh, the number one ranked uh, journal in the history and philosophy of science as of last year. I don't know what this year's uh, impact ranking is. And then my colleague Katina Michael, um, who we share with um, one of our schools of engineering and the School for the Future of Innovation Society is the editor-in-chief of IEEE's new flagship technology and society um, uh, proceedings. And that comes out of uh, one of the earlier versions of the not quite flagship level of IEEE publications. And they have done special issues around PIT. Um, and then there are, depending on which uh, science or technology you're affiliated with, often relatively or significantly high quality blank and society journals that will publish uh, PID activities as well.
Um, if I may, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, as somebody who is creating a new unit with faculty to be tenured, I have to think about this. So I'll, I'll give two answers. First, direct answer to your question. Pitt, to me, is, is a, a field of fields. It's not one thing, right? So uh, it's like when you talk about the social sciences. We don't have a department of social sciences. We have a whole bunch of departments that are social science departments. So if we think about PIT that way, then within PIT, you have academic communities starting to form. Next April, we'll host in this space an ACM CS Law Conference. It's the fourth one. Publication venue, some of the most senior people are in it. There are journals coming out along these lines. So, so I will look at, at, at the leadership of the interdisciplinary field that you're working on to do this. Now, the second part of my answer is not a direct answer to your question, but you're thinking about publication because that's important for tenure. When you create a unit where the focus is on impact on society, then tenure should be based on the impact you make. I said it's very, sorry. Oh, no. great. <laughs> Supporting. Uh, I thought I was doing something wrong. <laughs> um, so, so, and this is why one reason when I said you, we have to create a unit outside the existing structures is because we get the opportunity to rewrite what tenure means, right? So that's the other piece, is that I believe that if PIT becomes a field, and it is, then slowly it will happen. Universities are very slow. What counts as impact will start changing. So in, in, in my world, when we rewrote the tenure, so of course publications are important, citations are important, but also is, is what you develop being used? Did it change a policy? Uh, did it, is that a piece of software that you have done? Is there data that you came up with? We want to count this. As a matter of fact, we even said something else. If you collaborated with somebody, and they are the ones who got all the benefits of your technology, and you're a third author there, they couldn't have done it without you. That's a contribution. So, so I, think, I think that's actually the bigger question, is, is how can we now shift academia to recognize impact as opposed to uh, adding to the body of knowledge. This goes back to my, let's make the ivory towers into a public square. <laughs> thank you so much, Azar. Um, unfortunately, we are at time. Um, I wanted to thank all the panelists, if we could give them a round of applause. Um, but thank you again for, for joining us today. Right.